series number i don't know four or five i got so many coming up it's ridiculous it's the big bad devil daddy himself and this time i brought along a super super fantastical legendary film composer john masari and as you can see he's brought a few little of his friends with him uh as you uh probably uh well know that he is the reason for the music of Killer Clowns from Outer Space. Without him, it wouldn't have been as fun, dark, and spooky as hell. So before we get into this storied career, because he's literally worked for every major person out there. So uh, we're going to take a quick commercial break uh, to uh, our brothers over at... Uh... Oh, shoot, man. The, 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 the doll's fucking me up. <laughs> I love it. Ah, see, eat that pizza now. <laughs> uh, over at uh, uh, Villain Arts Tattoo Conventions. Check that shit out while I pick myself up off the fucking ground. Here we go. That's right, Villain Arts Tattoos, biggest, largest conventions in the U.S. If they come to your town, you know what the fuck to do. Go there, get yourself some quality ink, as well as taking in all the amazing performers and vendors that are there. So without further ado, John Masari, how you doing tonight, my brother? I'm doing fine. While we're on the subject of ink, uh, you seem like you're pretty well... Um inked up uh do you you probably have a story for every every particular i have a very good friend i'm going to shout out a friend of mine uh there's two friends actually ashley uh with two e's and jackie with two e's they have some of the coolest killer clown tattoos around they're uh close friends of mine one lives in connecticut and one lives here in california and they're and as you can imagine they're major killer clown fans and um, they, uh, Jackie with two E's always asked me, you know, are you ever going to get a tattoo? And I go, I haven't figured out what to put on this Italian boy's body. I really haven't figured it out. Actually, I did come up with something, but I don't know if I'm going to do it. It's more of a, um, a slogan than a design. But I'm sure with all your, every single one has a story and a memory and the reason why you got it. Absolutely. You can point to it. Um, you think of doing a podcast where you just like talk about your tattoos. Ah, oh, man, that, I don't know. It might fill up an hour. It just depends yeah. on if uh, my viewers actually want to hear the stories. <laughs> well, I, I'm always fascinated. There's a there's someone I work with um, who's the CEO of a CEO of a company called Extreme Music and uh, Bleeding Fingers. Ah, which is an out that's uh, was founded by 
uh, a group of really awesome composers. A uh, principal among them was Hans Zimmer. Anyways, the Ooh. CEO, his name is uh, Russell Emanuel. And every year he gets a new tattoo. <laughs> And he has a story uh, behind each one. He's an uh, incredible bass player. He used to play in a uh, punk uh, band in London called uh, Finger. I think that's the name <laughs> of the band. I like it. It's simple. Yeah. And so here we are. Um, what, do you have? I'll answer your questions, or I'll just. We have to keep it for with an hour or half an hour. Uh, like I said, usually an hour. It don't okay. matter if we go over it. Not okay, a big deal. I'm fine. I'm fine with the, an hour or so. I just don't want to. I don't, <laughs> don't want to blow your um, your. Uh, uh, You're totally your format. Fine. I don't want to uh, our, our, blow your my format. My format is simple. It's it's called having fun, and okay. all my demons out there love to have fun with every That's, guest that we come uh, with. Yeah. So. Especially uh, Kyler, who just said, uh, welcome, John, to the show, and thanks for being part of my childhood nightmares. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm very happy, Kyler, that it's a part of part, some part of your life. But that, you gotta admit, <laughs> that guy's pretty creepy. Th this is a uh, Spirit Halloween, and this is uh, Royal Bobbles. This is, in my opinion, nice. is the best shorty. I mean, they really got they really got him down. They, they got did the, the proportions just just perfect. So, anyway. absolutely. So, so uh, good evening to you, way. Paul. And uh, so, when you when was the at, at what point did you decide that you know film score, uh, you know, composing and you know TV as well. Uh, when did at what point did you decide that that's what you wanted to do? Was there a film or a, or a show that kind of kicked that off for you? I, I think it was kind of an evolution. First of all, music. I always loved music. Music always captivated me in a way and uh, that is I can't ex express with words, but it, it, gave, it gave me an experience and put me in a frame of mind. Ever since I was a little kid, I mean, I was fascinated with the radio. I couldn't, you couldn't get me away from the radio. It got to the point where my parents got sick and tired of, uh, of waking up at 2.30 in the morning to me playing with the hi-fi system in the living room. Nice. You know? So they got me a little radio and I would just look at that thing and listen to music constantly. And in my, in my mind, I romanticized that like, all the bands they're always at the radio station making music all the time yeah they're, they're actually they're playing and we're listening to them play and i didn't realize that they're constantly playing recordings and it you know until i was like four then i realized mm -hmm. oh you mean this record they play at the record you know station <laughs> and i just i was i was i listened to everything i would listen to classical music i would listen to um there was this, they had these series of records called, um, um, they were played by an, uh, uh, an orchestra called the 101 Strings. And they played mm -hmm. whatever pop music was being released that year, they would do like a string orchestra arrangement of it. And uh, there was a radio station that just played that stuff all the time. Amazing. And I used to listen to that. I listened to the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, Herman's Hermits. Um, and uh, I used to sing along. I wanted to play guitar so bad. Oh, I wanted to play guitar so so. I wanted to play guitar so bad. I I I got a ruler, and strung up rubber bands on it, and pretended, you know, <laughs> listen to it. <clears throat> so okay, so we're gonna talk about the evolution. So there was a period in American history, uh, um, you know, it was like during the Vietnam War, <clears throat> the early days earlier days of the Vietnam War. And um, <clears throat> there was a, a scare that we had where the Soviet Union decided like decided it would be just like the United States had missiles in Europe. They thought it'd be a good idea to put missiles with nuclear warheads in, in, on Cuba. Fun. And this was called the Cuban <laughs> Missile Crisis, right? Oh, so yeah. It was in October. Is it in the month of October, a million years ago, 
And uh, this empty field, I grew up in, um, I was born in New York, but we grew up in Southern California. And there was this area by near Disneyland called Garden Grove. Empty field, not too far from our house, literally a few blocks. We, we basically lived uh, kind of like between um, Disneyland and um, Knott's Berry Farm, mm -hmm. right? I don't know if you've heard of sure. those two amusement parks. But anyways, um, so there's this empty <laughs> field and not far from this empty field was this tower with a big white ball on it, right? And uh, so all of a sudden this empty field was full of missiles that I oh, later shit. find out are called Nike missiles. They were anti-aircraft, anti-ballistic missiles that were just there. It was a probably, probably, it seemed like a whole it seemed like hundreds, but there's probably like 40 or 50 of them, right? And right. <laughs> um, and I thought, I thought, oh, this is part of the moon program. This is part ah. of the space program. These are space. You're going to be going to, not really. So during this time, the all the the grownups were going crazy, collecting, you know, toilet paper, cans of beans, and figuring out what they're going to do during this apocalyptic event. And the kids, it was. It was Halloween. We were just having fun. So they, the, the theater had a bunch of, um, we're playing all kinds of movies. All right. You know, parents would say, here, just go to the movies. Here's, here's 25 cents. Go to the movies. Get out of our hair while we prefer. Back when you could do that. Event. So um, I saw this one uh, triple feature. It was Journey to the, the Earth, The Time mm. Machine, and Mysterious Island. And I was captivated like literally like glued to my seat and i go that was incredible there's another one. there's another one there's another one and so after that said like no no other movies could compare i was trying mm -hmm. to look for a movie with that experience i found out later what really affected me with those movies was the music soundtracks how important the music yes. was in being part of the the whole landscape of your of your cinematic experience so it wasn't till uh and and of course my my mom had a piano she started taking piano lessons she 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 just couldn't do it and i picked it up from there and i used to tape um i used to watch lost in space um with, oh yeah uh, that was right, huge back then right with uh john johnny williams score by johnny williams and i used to take we had this like little uh, Philco reel to reel, uh, Phillips reel to reel uh, tape recorder, tiny little thing. And I used to take, if I heard something that was interesting, I'd tape it and then play it back, you know, put the thing up to the television, had this like little tiny microphone. And then I'd sit at the piano and I'd try to like figure out what it was that I liked about it, you know. I did not realize that it was a, um, a, a a skill that you could learn to be a film composer and um a, in an actual occupation an actual career right yeah until i was like 11 yeah. or 12. 11 it's or 12. not like something that they push you know when they're pushing marching band and you know yeah. symphony band and orchestra and exactly exactly <laughs> um so anyway so the, i so i say since i was 11 or 12 that's what i wanted to do Wow! And, but I also I also played all kinds of music, in in um, there's a band that I played in called Crisis, and nice. um, we, we one year when uh, David Bowie released Changes, to oh the changes, yeah, um, we said oh we got to write original music because that that's that's so awesome, <laughs> and and also there's a band that I think David Bowie produced I'm not sure David Bowie or someone else produced called. Uh, it was a band called Mott the Hoople, and they had a band called, uh, they had a song called All the Young Dudes. And we, we used to, our band used to play that. And then, and then we said, you know, we got to, we got to come up with our own music. And so that's where the Killer Clown March. That's where that came from. I did it. Ah. And, and the guys in my band said, that sounds too jazzy, man. It's too jazzy. It's not, it's not rock and roll enough. And so, you know, we're going to do it. And so uh, years later, when I saw the film, I said, I'm going to haul that thing out of mothballs and see if it works. And 
And so that's how that worked. And I would say, you know, if I was going to say to other um, people, I mean, I know people that may have a horrendously, uh, incredibly six career doing commercial music. When I say commercial music is that their production facility gets called and say, we need this kind of music for this project and they'll cook it up for it. Right. And I, I did that for the longest time. Uh, you know, there was an expectation that like, well, if you're going to go to college, are, are you going to, after you graduate, are you going to, you know, work at Warner Brothers and fill out an application there and work as a composer for them? And I, I had no idea about that. Right. And, and that's not the way it works, you know? So I made the mistake, career mistake of trying to please everyone by showing them how much work I can get, I'm using air quotes here, work I can get that paid. And, um, you know, you just have to know where the money is, where, where the demand is. Like I worked in commercials for a long time and I must say, although it was very interesting and I got, a, I learned a lot of techniques. I learned a lot of, uh, product, got a lot of production chops, composing chops. It wasn't as fulfilling as doing your own music. And I grew up in a neighborhood that was far from the lads in Metallica. And they followed the music that they wanted to do. They knew exactly what they wanted to do. I mean, I didn't, I didn't know them, but they're in my neighborhood. And I, I look at them at, with such fondness. And I'm saying, you know, I, I could have been like one of uh, their, uh, you know, one of the people in that, you know, if I had pursued that, but that's not way I'm very happy where I am right now. Cause it's, it's my life. So, um, but I, I would say to new people, you know, you got to do what's going to, you're going to feel really comfortable, comfortable with. I mean, cause I can tell you doing commercial music is like, you're at the, you're at the mercy of people that like will hear one little tiny chord and not like it for some reason. You have no idea why they don't like it. It's really subjective. But I know exactly you have to, what you you're to, talking about. You have to go <laughs> along with it because they're paying the bill. You know, it says, well, this is going to be your third rewrite. And uh, if this doesn't work, we'll give you what's called a kill fee. And then you're done. Uh. And then we'll go to another composer agency. And uh, uh, excuse me, um, not a composer agency, uh, another music production company to do this commercial. And I have with commercials all the time. I mean, I, I worked on I. I worked on I worked on commercials from like the mid '90s to the mid 2000s, or maybe up until 2010, the 2000s. Um, well, no, that's not the full 2000s. Uh, up to about 2009, I worked uh, at a really cool music production house that was run by uh, one of the guys who was an arranger, producer, and um, also a synthesizer programmer for like David Bowie, Michael Jackson, um, uh, worked on some big albums, right? And he parlayed that um, that cred, that street cred, into having a real kick-ass uh, commercial music production company. And so, like he were, you know, he would find guys that are good. I guess I was good, and I I worked for him on and off like for ten years. But I'm one of of like. 30 guys mm. right so i did that for a while now i did that for a while this is after killer clowns from outer space and killer clowns from outer space has its own story i mean basically when it was released it was released in like no theaters it was out for like a day and a half at, at every city they only made a limited number of prints so anytime it got a good review in a the Kiara brothers will tell you the same thing anytime it got a good review in the city uh people would come to see it oh i read the review in the papers you know like the paper came to my <laughs> doorstep i read uh -huh. the review because i felt like seeing the movie this weekend oh there's a crazy movie it kind of reminds me of beetlejuice sort of i think i want to see this movie and you go to the movie theater and it's gone right <laughs> so right uh chris young who did um Hellraiser, right? Oh, uh, yes. I went, to, I went to school with him, right? Okay. I also went to school with uh, the guy who did the music for the um, for the Matrix, right? And so, I uh, not the guy, that made, Don Davis did the Matrix, but uh, Chris Young, Christopher Young, 
I told him, you're so lucky that your movie was in the theaters for like six weeks. I mean, I said, <laughs> yeah, your movie, your that movie was long was in those the days. So long. Your first movie. I saw it twice. Right. Yeah. I said, you know, I want to see that movie again. I, I kind of like what Chris did, you know. So um, I said, you're so lucky. It's taken 35 years for it to come out of the closet, so to speak, you know, because the because the fans have spoken. I mean, if something's good, that's why I think you should yeah. be discouraged if something isn't like a raving success the second you... Do. It may take a while to find an audience. And then again, it may never find an audience. You know, you know, that's just the way it is. I worked on so many projects that will never, ever see the light of day. They're, just, they're so mired in lawsuits and, and copyright problems that... Oh, uh, my goodness. Ownership problems. They'll just never, you know, really great stuff. I put, I put, everyone put a lot of work into it and it's just sitting on a shelf. And who knows? Might, they might show up at, um, at, a, at a film convention at some point. But um, <laughs> I, hope I'm not, I hope I'm not going off into um, crazy no, conspiracy uh... land. Uh, Actually, you know, you really you really covered a lot there. Uh, my question is, did you ever think that, uh, you know, that the the theme uh, mm -hmm. for Killer Clowns was going to become this celebrated? Because when I say Killer Clowns from Outer Space is a cult classic, I mean mm -hmm. just that. <laughs> right. Ab absolutely. Well, and I, I totally understand what you're saying when i first saw the movie I, and they came up to the scene where in that uh in the forest there's that spaceship tent i mm -hmm. fell in love with the movie i said i'm all in i am all in i do i'm gonna do whatever it takes to do this movie and um and before that let me set the stage before that when uh, i got a call from a friend of mine that i worked with on a number of projects and he was working at the Disney company at the time, because I was working at the Disney company too, on and off. It done the wonderful world of Disney theme, all kinds of stuff for the Disney channel. Wow. All kinds of promotional stuff. And um, I, uh, he said, you know, I have some friends that I used to work with in commercials in, in DC, uh, back east in, uh, you know, Washington, DC. And um, they're out here, they're doing special effects and visual effects, and they did their first movie. And they're look, they're having a hard time finding composers that they like. And I, and I recommended you, but you may, you're such a serious composer, you may not want to be, it may not be something that's your cup of tea. And I go, well, why would that be? He says, well, the title alone. I go, okay, <laughs> what's the title? I go, killer clowns from outer space. And I go, if there's a dinosaur in there, <laughs> if there's dinosaurs and a spaceship and a flying saucer and killer clown, I'm, I'm there. I'm there. there, there I mean, there that's were, a party, you know? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, I totally agree. And before that, I had seen Richard Elfman's um, Forbidden Zone. Oh, yeah. And I thought to myself, I would love to do a movie like that where it's like, Wow, I don't understand this movie, but I want to see it again. <laughs> that kind yeah. of thing. I you go, know, the realm of, I, of sci fi horror. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's only been like a handful. And then I was just having this conversation earlier with somebody today. Uh, I was like, you know, if it wasn't for Alien having a thousand sequels and Predator having a, a thousand sequels, it's like, there wasn't really a, a whole lot of room, you know, for, right. for anything new. So I was like, shit for killer. Clown, I, love, I love alien. I love predator. I, I love predator so much. I have a bunch of fan theories. Um, it went, oh, <laughs> so you and I will talk about that when we see each other, maybe at a convention one of these days, for if sure. I ever, get, I if hope. I ever get invited to one, but in any event, um, so I, um, uh, uh, so you asked me, did I think it was going to become a success? Well, uh, around that time, uh, Tim Burton released um, Beetlejuice. And I thought, this makes sense. It's Killer Clowns from Outer Space. It's like horror comedy. It has a little sci-fi in it. Just like, and I love Beetlejuice. I absolutely loved it. And so, um, so I had to audition for the movie and I, I picked a scene when the kids first come up to the uh, spaceship 
Yeah. And they get in and they get chased out. And then the clowns come back to life and march on the, the town. And I figure if you only saw one scene of the movie, saw that scene, it's like really sets the, it's like a keystone moment, you know? So that's the scene that I chose to score as an audition. Mm-hmm. And immediately I got a call just like a day and a half after I delivered the the demo you know and uh they really uh liked it steve um Kiero called me he says well looks looks like you're the chosen composer and uh and i said that's fantastic and i just i just dived into it head head on i, I worked on it every single day we had um, a relatively tight schedule the first day of recording was uh, halloween it was mm. uh it was a saturday october 31st and uh that's nice. awesome and i can't i went to a halloween party afterwards and and i was says I, this is so perfect why i just had a recording session for a movie called killer clowns from outer space and it's going to be a great halloween movie that's where you meet the first one. so you got to watch out for the negative uh, <laughs> feedback because people go just already assume oh it's a piece of crap oh god why would you want to do that <laughs> I don't know. Why would uh, after movie movies like Basket Case about and... a... Yeah, you know, it's like that's the title of the movie. Come on. So, uh, you know, it's amazing how it's amazing how many people will climb up in a tree to kick it, kick a kid down from his dreams. You know, it just, that it something... just you just got you just have to start off as, uh, 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 accepting that people are just not going to get your shit. They're just not right. going to get it. And the people that do, good, good for them. But um, anyways, uh, you know, and I, I remember when, after I worked on it, I had, uh, well, I kind of encapsulate the timeline. It was like probably a year or two after I worked on the film, I said, can I, I talked to the music director for the company that was still there. I said, can I please have the masters back? Uh, Cause I want to do a record mix nice of the right because you know there's a mix that you do for the movie mix it in a specific way for a movie i'm not going to go into all that detail i mean right you know you the recording engineer does that and um you format it a certain way so that it sits with everything in the movie dialogue and sound effects then i wanted to do a record mix so i did a record mix and i was able to um uh, master it transfer the mix onto a digital medium which i had you know and then when hard drives were very efficient i um made them into um i think at the time it wasn't wave files yet they were called something else it was an apple format anyways it doesn't matter um now they're on wave files but um anyways so I saved it, and that became the uh, what you hear on the Waxworks release. Because uh, you know, probably by this time the tapes, the original tapes, are all maybe degraded. You know, depending on how they've been stored. But it sounded so good that they they loved the way it sounded. That uh, that we ended up using that for the uh, the vinyl LP for Waxworks. Nice. So, so in answer to your question, I had all the faith in the world in it. I o- always enjoyed it. I used to tell people all my throughout all my career. I said, they said, "What's your favorite project?" Or, oh, there's a, a little crazy film I worked on that that shows on cable every once in a while called Killer Clowns from Outer Space. It's one of my favorites. And they roll their eyes up in their head. I go, "No one rolls Aren't their they eyes on up. Tubi? They don't <laughs> roll their eyes up in their head now. They, you know." especially now we got a video game coming out so right got a couple things from uh the crowd out here in black flame land yeah so paul asks john is there going to be another killer clowns movie or is someone trolling us fans i don't think no one no one's going to troll the fans but what what i can tell you is that the video game's coming we're good work i'm still working on the video game by the way I still have it up on my system. I'm pointing. Oh, wait a minute. Where are you? Where'd you go? <laughs> Here we are. Uh, it's it's on my system. I'm still working on the video game. So the video game's not ready yet. 
But when the video right. com- comes out, I think everyone's going to be very happy. Now, will that? Oh, I guarantee. As, will that act as a springboard? That you know, that, that's my fan uh, theory aspiration. Will that be a springboard? Will people say, "Oh, you know, it's time to to haul it out and make a film"? But you know, what has got to be right if you're going to do a movie. I think the Kyoto brothers definitely. All three of them have to be. I say three. See like that. Three, <laughs> all three of the Kyoto brothers have have to be involved, in right? Um, and we can't shoehorn in stuff that other people want. Want it's got to come out of their brain because they have a very specific mindset. Let them do their thing. You know what I'm saying? Right. It's like when they gave me the music score, they said, "Listen." We hate just about every horror movie score that we hear. We want something that we really like that's very unique. So you have to distinguish yourself and make something unique. And so I just did whatever I wanted to do. I didn't right. think about like, oh, I've got to let me let me take the soundtrack to some other movie. Now, did I take soundtracks of uh, classical music and put it up against? And the reason why I do that is because some classical music is very you know it's very dark some some composers well some i'm i'm looking for form some gotcha. many composer composers work years on a symphony um and then uh they they just have a certain uh cadence and format to them sometimes when you throw them throw it up against a scene you go oh i like it it changes there's a it it goes from this one idea and then there's a um, transition point here which which almost works perfectly with that and then it goes to somewhere else so it's about form you know what i'm saying it's not like oh i'm gonna take those notes and try to copy them you know although sometimes mm-hmm. it happens sometimes i quote motifs from other composers which is supposed to be okay to do um but when i say other composers i'm talking about like Brahms. i'm talking about like uh, there's an Italian composer named Respighi who who was kind of like um, Ottorino Respighi who he, he was kind of like the Claude Debussy of Italy and then there's a composer named Arnold Bax and all these composers have this this wonderful sense of color and, and melody and, and so I kind of like use that as a springboard to create my music when I have to do something um, that's kind of orchestral you know mm-hmm. and then um, so anyways, um, so in any event, so I had to like do that and just pray that it worked for everyone, right? And yeah. um, the Kyoto Brothers came to a few of the recording sessions. They, they liked what they heard. Uh, there, there was at one point that I was really on my own for like two or three weeks. I didn't hear, hear from them at all. So we went to the sound stage, And the one thing that they really liked that they that they remembered they didn't really get to talk to me about was the scene where the clowns have that big machine and they're vacuuming up all the, yeah. um, the cotton candy things. That shit was eerie as hell. Y- yes. And, and they, they stood up, they go, Oh my gosh, this is great. We were worried that the seventh reel, cause that was at the seventh reel. Mm-hmm. People are going to put people to sleep. Cause the seventh reel is where you have to like re reignite the story and the chase you know you go Mm -hmm. into your you go into hyperdrive at that point because you want you want to grab your audience and take them with the take them with the story even though the kyoto brothers will tell you that their model for the script their story structure and Mm -hmm. pacing was from the blob which by the way i saw i knew it it. yeah i saw i freaking knew it (laughs) <laughs> yeah, because no one believed that there was this blob thing eating people, right? And it's, this were clowns instead. <laughs> so, anyways, so wh- when that came, up, they said they told me so all the other composers when they did that scene, it sounded so lame. They had some kind of a weird circus lullaby that just just what nothing nothing worked. It, as a matter of fact, it made the scene look silly and stupid, mm. and so. I treated that scene as if I was doing uh, a documentary about Nazi tanks rolling into St. Petersburg <laughs> or rolling into Poland. 
you know, just like a complete invasion of, you know, I, I just wanted it to sound legitimate on its own end, you know, just, Oh, it cer- certainly came out that way. Yeah. And, and, uh, there's some, when, when I do go to some conventions, I get like band nerds that come up to me and says, you know, the scene where they're vacuuming, that's a great trumpet part. It's like, is that in seven, four? I go, yeah, it's like, it's, 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 a, it's, a, <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's, um, it, it's got, a, 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 you know, a variety of, um, of uh of tempos and, and meters in there uh me- meters and uh time signatures you know yeah it's, it's not just straight four four you're absolutely right and he says will you ever write that for an orchestra i go i already did if you he i i i released a uh, reimagined album where we re-recorded it with an orchestra we also did a concert for the 30th anniversary with oh, wow. an or with an orchestra playing to the film of which I would like more people to see, and I'm I'm working on that. Uh, we we that took a video of it. These balls. I had a really awesome orchestra, and I had um, uh, there's um, a, a guy named Matthew Heitschu. He directed it and edited it, and had all the hip. I think he had like seven cameras on the whole event. Um, um, <clears throat> Chuck Serino, who did the sound design for Killer Class from Outer Space, was also there with his camera equipment. You know, t- taping, uh, getting it all uh, taken down. So that, uh, you know, basically saving it for posterity. And it was a really, it was a lot of energy. The Dickies played with the orchestra, uh, and it was really awesome. And I guess this is, okay, so we're going to go to really quick uh, do i spill the beans so let me spill the beans (laughs) feel free to spill the beans (laughs) no one nobody approached me and said hey john you know what you know it's coming up to the 30th anniversary of killer concert in space what do you think about having an orchestra at a big theater like a thousand seat theater and we project it on the screen and you conduct an orchestra of your music what do you think? No one did that. That was my right. idea. Everyone thought it was crazy, by the way. <laughs> well, who's going to want to see that? I don't know. Right. You, if I told up in the next room and I tell you I have an orchestra there, you're going you're gonna to see a movie that you like with an orchestra playing score. And wouldn't you want? Oh, yeah, it sounds good. But, but again, People think that, you know, well, I wouldn't know how to do that. So I don't like the idea. You don't have to go. All you have to do is sit your ass in a seat and watch the damn thing. You don't right. have, I'm not going to, I'm not asking you how to do it. I'm telling you that I'm doing it. You know, this is, aren't you going to, aren't you afraid you're going to get sued by MGM? I, well, they can't sue me. It's impossible. Why? Because I just paid them a huge amount of money in a licensing fee to do it. Cause so they're on board with it. So if you want to come to my concert, um, here's where you can buy some tickets. <laughs> so anyway, so that and a lot of the things I've done are things that I've designed, you know, myself to do. Uh, because that's how much I love this little movie. And that's how much I love the fact that um, uh, fans have loved this movie all these years and really kept it alive all this time and if it wasn't for the fans love i would not have gone through that trouble of of getting uh all the you can see it on my youtube channel there's a an abbreviated version i think we do the grand finale it's like you'll see it. it's one of my youtube on my youtube channel it's one of my uh, youtube videos so you can get an idea of that absolutely and um uh what is the, is it under your, just your name or? Yeah. John Masari. You want to plug that? Yeah, absolutely. John Masari YouTube. It's, I'm the, I'm the only <clears throat> John Masari there. Fantastic. You know, and it's kind of funny that you mentioned that because uh, it kind of reminds me of like Gal- the movie Galaxy Quest, mm-hmm. how, you know, fans can be so immersed you know, in every detail of a film, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that they would be able to like pull those, those little details out. Uh, And I think that's really refreshing. Mm -hmm. Um, 
and uh, we definitely should see you more, uh, you know, in uh, conventions. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, do, do you have any planned for the future? Well, no, I haven't been invited to uh, any. I did. I did something at um, HorrorCon LA uh, because ah. MGM wanted to. MGM wanted to um, make a, a special presentation announcement for the video game, and uh, basically we did a Q and A. And I put on a show later on. The Dickies and I performed uh, later on. Fantastic. And so I know they this last uh, September. I'm I'm working on the I'm putting the video footage together. I may I may. Uh, release uh, uh like a, a teaser on that uh and i haven't really released many photographs we've got, got some great photo stills from that whole evening and uh i just want to be able to do let some time go by let the let the dust settle a little bit and then come back and reveal uh all the really cool stuff we had a really nice um perf night um I had a good uh, reception and the Dickies as well as always. And it's always fun to work with the Dickies. And I, I, on the video game, I have, um, one, of, one of, uh, the Dickies drum, the, the Dickies drummer, one of the members of the Dickies, the drummer, Adam, uh, Gomez plays on the soundtrack as well as, um, David Ben Selig and, um, Eddie Tater plays mm -hmm. uh, bass. So on a few cuts, not on all of them. There's a, there's a ton of musicians playing on it. I had um, at one point, you know, the budget for the um, music was not that high because I wanted to do some, some some things with a live orchestra. So I put out the word in Europe um, that I'm looking for you know, a small string section to do some of the strings. And this one producer calls me back, not calls me, excuse me, gets in touch with me. He says, I, I'd be glad to do it. I could do it, no problem. And I look at where he is, and he's in Ukraine. He's in Kiev, Ukraine. I go, aren't you, aren't you guys in the middle of a war? Yeah, but we really need to work. And I said, well, wow. I said, well, oh, you know what? You know, it's kind of hard to say the, no to that. You do. You got the job. You got the job. He goes, no, let me just tell you, I'm a, I'm a producer. I'm a primarily a metal drummer, but I can record strings like class and I can get classical musicians. We have some of the best classical musicians in the world. I'll get you only the best guys. And I go, okay. That's because the um, best metal is in Europe. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so, so, um, so anyways, I give him the parts and then he, he says, he shows them back to me. Okay. I made the parts for, you know, I, I gave him the music parts for all the stringed instruments. And then he goes, I just want to make sure I got it right. Can you proofread it for me? Proofread it for him. And then I did, then he says, okay, we're going to record pretty soon. I go, well, what's pretty soon? Probably in the next day. Okay. So a day goes by, two days go by. Pretty fast two, turnaround. Three days go by. <laughs> Two weeks go by and I'm following the news and I'm hearing that, you know, Russian troops are on the borders of Kiev. They're sending in rockets and stuff like that. And I'm going, oh, my God, what did I do? I put these guys in harm way. What if what if on their way to the recording studio? Holy shit. They get hurt. You know, they get blown up. Yeah, exactly. And I'm just like going, oh, this was a bad idea. I, I, I felt personally responsible. I felt like, you know, if they die because they're playing on my dumb video game score i'm gonna just feel absolutely horrible and then all of a sudden out of nowhere john i have uh it's, his name is anatoly is anatoly mm -hmm. i have i have your music tracks and i have a video of the strings playing the the score i'm going hey, you can anatoly! see, you, you can see, you can see awesome. it on uh, you can see it on uh if you go through what used to be called twitter uh, somewhere down in there, you'll see a, a little uh, a promo video of the guys playing uh, a oh, violin in the, in this basement, um, and it's like, and I go, I'm told, is everything okay? Yeah, it's okay. We had to go do our duty for a, for about a week, and I go, what does that mean? Oh, you know, anyone can anyone that can hold a rifle, that right, has to go do stuff. And I go, man, I'm glad you got got through with it. Oh yeah, everyone. Really, 
we're re we're really organized here when it comes to uh, making war against the Russians. And I go, wow, if you're if your fighting is anything um, uh, as powerful as your uh, musical performance, uh, I think uh, you guys are you guys are really badass. So yeah, anyway, so that's a that's a that's, that's a story. A serious that I, dedication. I don't think I told, I don't. I, I have not told that story to anyone. This is an exclusive on your show. You heard it here first out there yep. in Black Screen Land. I told you I was going to spill the beans. So you better get this video game on that alone. Absolutely. Holy crap. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Woo! Now, for many of you out there in Black Flame Land. John has worked for so many of the biggest companies out there doing, uh, you know, scoring for shows and, you know, obviously film. So anything from Disney to HBO, you name it, he's done it. So you've definitely done some awesome projects like this right here for Full Moon. Um, Oh, I got a story for that, but we can I can tell you later. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that at all. Okay, you want uh, me to tell you as now? well. Yeah. Sure. Um I will I never mean, work for Full Moon ever in my entire life. Ever. I worked for them once and will never work for them again. There's a, a really awesome director, his name is David Dakota, really wonderful guy. He's got, definitely he's familiar got with like him. <laughs> a million things. He used to work with Roger Corman. He says, John, could you please yes. do film? I go, for you, I will do it. And so uh, someone at Full Moon said, listen, if I were you, this is when you had to actually deliver tapes, not send audio files. Oh, So you yeah. had to like give, it was like, it called a DA-88. It was an eight track digital tape that had all the music on it. And I said, uh, and by the way, uh, the, the tape that they gave me, the videotape that they gave me to score to had no dialogue and no sound effects. It was like a silent film. So I was just going blind on it. I just Woo! assumed what it was about. So someone at the company said, listen, don't deliver the last half. Why? Why is that? Because they won't pay you. You have to hold that. You literally have to hold your tapes ransom. So that's what I did. I held my tape ransom and I said, I need to have a bank check. And you know, and I, I, and I had them, had them give me the number, and so I can call uh, my bank and say, "This, I, someone wrote me a check, and this is the bank. This is the routing number. This is check number. This is okay. That IDs out there picked it up, dropped it off, and I said, I'll never work. I, I, there's just a, the people that I worked with. I don't know how it is now, but they were unscrupulous. They were just unscrupulous, and, um. There was there's they had communication problems. You couldn't get a call in because they had like this my goodness wacky <laughs> wacky phone system that like you know the, the music the quote unquote music director which turned out to be a nice guy he he was a really cool guy he he would tell oh, at one point he says are at what point are you going to deliver the music I go I've been calling I have half three quarters of the movie done I've been calling in and. and I have my calls are not going through. I've been leaving messages. So, anyways, I'll never work for them again. But although it was fun to work on that movie, I had a lot of fun working on the movie. Just I mean, it's Puppet Master. How could you not have fun with that? I had fun composing the music, and and other people that have worked with that company before. I tell them that story, and they said, "Yeah, that's the that's the way it goes over there." So, I mean, you've even been a part of the Wizarding World. Yeah. Yes. And uh, I know myself, a huge nerd <laughs> of uh, the uh, Harry well, Potter series. So that is from a um, there was a company that would do uh, behind the scenes, like very sophisticated behind the scenes, practically do like a feature length, deep dive study into how a particular. Made. And uh, so they use my music in that in that uh in that particular um the wizarding world um behind the scenes video yes that had to be an absolute blast for you yeah oh yeah it was it was i would love to do the original but you know i'm not i'm not hooked up in that in that scene yet but so <laughs> but there's always there's still time i got i got a lot of miles left on me Oh, absolutely. And then you've even done uh, some scoring for one of my favorite shows 
right. of all time. Right. <laughs> when I think of crime dramas, I I I, I look back to the Shield because mm -hmm. it was just so groundbreaking, mm -hmm. and it's just amazing that you know your music was uh, a part of that. What yeah, was it like that, doing it uh, for for that crime drama series? Well, it's it's really cool. That's uh, that's that's my association with um, a movie a uh, movie uh, a company called uh, Extreme Music. Ah. So that's that's through them. And um, the the way I worked, I I mean, I, there was a certain kind of music I used to listen to when when I went when I went to college. I worked at um, an oil refinery. And sometimes I would just like either get there, get to work too early or I would leave and I didn't feel like going home. And so I would hang around in the neighborhoods. This is in uh, a part of uh, L.A. called San Pedro. And mm. around San Pedro was was um, there's Long Beach. Uh, there's Wilmington. Uh, there's um, what is it called? Landero Heights. Anyways, these cool neighborhoods where you've got it's, it's very mixed uh ethnicities and um a lot of uh low riders the cars that bounce up sure. and down they play the best music no oh. they play the best and so you i betcha. just used to hang around and just kind of like take in the music from the the neighborhoods luckily i didn't get uh, hijacked or anything like that but uh i was i wasn't giving off i wasn't giving off uh um uh, victim you weren't vibes, oozing machismo sure. <laughs> yes right but i was just there listening to music and um so it's like that so it was like an interesting um combination of uh slow jam r b mixed with uh, you know um uh, it wasn't called synth wave yet what was it called i i, I guess club and house oh music. gotcha Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so it's like it kind of like mixed them together, and that's what ended up in. And I always in, thought that the 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 music, I mean, it it could go from what you just described mm -hmm. to metal, uh, right? In some points, like when they were getting ready to to go out, it's uh, very dynamic, very dynamic. Yeah, just a just a crazy score. Yeah, um, but you know, a lot of people out there might not know. You know that you've done a lot of horror stuff as well, mm -hmm. uh, not just killer clowns like from from the dark. Mm -hmm. um, that was very see. interesting. There's some there's some um, actors in that 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 was like one of their first thing. That was really bizarre. Sure. That was a really cool concept. And it's like a classic um, horror concept. Let's take a location, we put a bunch of people in it, and one by one they die off. So the movies gets cheaper and cheaper to make. That's the illusion <laughs> cast. And it was just a lot of fun. That was a lot of fun. That was um, uh, directed by a friend of mine that lives in um, in Texas. And my, why Texas is my friend's name? Texas has a lot of good Give me his first uh, name. Just his first horror. name. What's that? I said uh, uh, Texas tends to put out a lot of really good indie horror. Yeah. Oh my gosh! Why am I forgetting his name? Okay, <laughs> look up the film. Uh, look up the film. Uh, big, uh, not Bigfoot. I did a movie with it has like a Bigfoot. Um, it's a horror movie. Oh my goodness! Are you going to edit this? Uh, I could. <laughs> okay, edit. You got to edit this part out because it's slowing me down now. <laughs> It's like I want to go to. Okay, I got to take a second now. I got to go to IMDb. I'm really having. Uh, I'm really beside myself. That I forgot his name. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> because I've worked with him on several projects, and that we've never met in person. You know, I, that's not the first time I've heard that. Um, there's a uh, another uh, gentleman that uh, I've you know, had a lot of directors on my show uh, mm -hmm. named Phil Herman, but it's like every director that he's, you know, asked me to interview. Uh, mm -hmm. They're like, I've never met him in person, but I've talked to him online. And he's like super awesome. <laughs> right. Wow. So, uh, why is that no happening? worries on that. 
<laughs> it's uh, a lot of times that's the way this business works, mm-hmm. um, you know, especially post COVID and right. Shoot. You name it. <laughs> Hold on. Just bear with me. I'm really embarrassed. Now. Oh, no okay. worries at all. No, not and at all. I, Anything goes on the underground. Page. <laughs> this is like, this is a, you know, this is like when you, you know, this is why like certain talk shows, they have um, <laughs> a laundry list of what you talk about and you don't deviate away from it because they want to avoid <laughs> situations exactly <laughs> like what we're going through right now nothing wrong with that at all okay. <laughs> okay so i just finished a horror movie uh i should say by someone i did meet tom devlin called uh teddy told me so Ooh, we teddy, like that teddy, teddy told me too that's really cool um and and I think that's gonna. He's already got like a doll of the of the main uh, monster, and then oh no kidding, yeah, nice. Tony Collins from Space, the game, son. <laughs> wow, there's more stuff that shows up. Then uh, okay, Cherokee Creek is the name of the movie, ah, and it was gotcha. about Bigfoot, yep. and it's directed by none other than my good friend. Todd Jenkins, who's also a really great actor. He's also a character actor and he's a filmmaker and he's a crack editor. Just like, just an awesome editor. He worked on a movie that was uh, one of these movies that will never see the light of day. It was a comic book movie where a comic book character comes to life and he's like a superhero and this little kid sure. who, who loves this guy loves this comic book characters goes into the comic book world to help him battle the forces of it was really awesome it'll it's, it'll never get shown <laughs> we, we worked our know. asses off on it and nothing happened to it it's just just really crazy so okay so um that movie that you showed me with the the little girl in the mm-hmm. um uh, the cabin that was one of his productions one of todd jenkins uh productions and uh i did that gosh that was like 2008 i was around the time that i did the um the cell part two i think yeah yeah that one Mm -hmm. that was really crazy. that was really crazy that was really that was a really sick story and that's one of those okay so uh, the quick the funny story about that movie is that they gave me the script right and mm-hmm. I read the script and I said, this is a really, this is a fucking great story. This oh, is yeah. scary, as, scary as hell. This is incredible. Then they finally showed me the first director's cut. And I'm looking through the movie. I'm going, wait a minute. You know, hold on a second. <laughs> going through the script. Where's page 28 through 38, 34? Where, what happened to that? So we had to take that scene out. That's like the best scene in this whole. That gets had, had my yeah. We just couldn't shoot it. We didn't have. Time oh to man! I go wow. Can you do like a behind the scenes? I'm like, can I describe it to the people? Yeah, do a deleted yeah. scene on the on the DVD. You know, that would be nice if it was a deleted scene if it got shot. Oh, <laughs> didn't, shit, even get, didn't, even shoot didn't even shoot it. Yeah. Damn it. So anyway, <laughs> it's crazy. So okay, hit me with another one. See who's next. See, who, see what. See what I. See what my reaction is. <laughs> I think we got one more for you here. Oh, this one here. Oh, final, uh, staff. final staff. Yeah, that was um, David Dakota directed that, and that had uh, some very alluring music. The girl that played the lead in that, she was really good. She was like this dominatrix kind of chick with like. Se- severe dominance vibes, right? Ah. And she was like, it's almost like little she whippy whippy. <laughs> more than that, man. More than that. <laughs> and um, uh, that was cool. That's another uh, thing where you have one location and oh, yeah. little by little people die off 
back and forth. And I think that was David Dakota's company's uh, Rapid Heart Pictures first thing. And he wanted me to launch it off. I had done another movie for, um, for Dave Dakota called Skeletons that um, was quite, um, <clears throat> quite, um, quite an interesting film in that he shot it. I'm looking up on IMDb. Um, <laughs> we're having fun, right? Didn't you say that you wanted fun? Here Anything it is, goes. Skeletons. <laughs> no, that's not. Here it is, Skeletons, directed by David Dakota. Okay, get this. Get this cast. Here's the cast: Christopher Plummer, D. Wallace. Oh, James, legend. James Colburn. Damn. Paul, Paul Bartel. Um, let me see. Uh, Kathleen Noon, Piper Laurie. Oh shit. Yeah. Uh, Carol okay. Baker. Got some heavy hitters in there. Yeah, Carol Baker, and I go, um, and I go, Dave, how did you get all these, uh, all these actors and actresses? And then he goes, he goes, John, people have to pay their alimony. <laughs> 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 so this way, this on the universal lot. Sad universal but true universal. and Holly weird. Yeah, <laughs> this was shot on the universal lot, and he says, John, you have to do it with a with an orchestra and they go uh, and I go and I said I agree with you so we recorded it with an orchestra and it was a lot of fun um and it's on and I, I had never released the soundtrack album to that I, I guess I should one day but um it did it did awesome. it did well on HBO but uh it's like it's just like a one of these movies that um and, and believe it or not Charles Band had some kind of uh, produced it in some way. Mm. Uh, I think. Uh, oh, I think. I think Charles Band uh, took it over, maybe, from the original company that had it. Anyway, so that's it, every film you work on has drama. Sure, absolutely. Just, I mean, tons, I, that's especially that's especially yeah. true in in yeah. indie film. Yeah. Uh, so. I don't know. Out of all the different genres that you've done composing for, mm -hmm. uh, would you say that, you know, horror has been the most uh, rewarding or because, I mean, you've done so many different, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. types mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, shows, films, right. all the big companies. But well, I, I, have really say, I, I have to say horror has, <laughs> horror has a special place in my heart. Right. Um, and because uh, you can you can ha you can have such a a, a huge range a, a gamut of emotions that you can put into a film because sometimes you need beauty you know um, oh yeah a, a good example of that is um in the exorcist right the exorcist theme is actually uh. a very, be very beautiful piece of music was not written for the exorcist it was a music piece of music onto its own that was recorded years earlier that completely embodies the mood of like innocence caught within evil. That's, that, mm -hmm. that, that that's motion there. And, and it's become a trope where you hear people kind of uh, copy that. Movie. I mean, I mean, you listen to the score to Halloween. It's basically like kind of like a ripoff <laughs> of, of the exorcist theme but um but no no i i really like the, the i love the horror community they're a very um in tune uh, uh, population of the music uh, of the music and movie loving uh, community and they have their own community it's it's it, very beautiful people very creative people i think horror best fans in the world yeah, I think horror brings out a lot of creativity in people, evidence of which you can see at a lot of the conventions where people get yes. dressed up in cosplay and they have they have their own they have their own uh, repertory of uh, cosplay that they do from their fa famous uh, their favorite horror movies. And they're just 
nice people. You know, you go to a horror convention and there's just like a cool vibe. It kind of reminds me if you ever go to a comedy concert, see a comic perform live, everyone showing up to the comedy concert is happy because they're oh, yeah. gonna laugh. You know, you're gonna you're you're going you're going to a place where a bunch of people are gonna be laughing, so you're already happy. And at a horror convention, I mean, people are there uh, because they enjoy it and they have a passion for it, and oh, uh, they I think they can express themselves. It's like it, nothing it was, else. There 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 there's a um, atmosphere uh of of uh you know the 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 playing field is level now whereas people that were normally um somewhat withdrawn uh and they can come out of their shell you know and sure. be it's and like be a sense of and be appreciated you know and be appreciated that's that's always one it's it's amazing how many beautifully creative people are in the um, horror commu horror fan community it's incredible it is absolutely. And, uh, definitely hope that, uh, you know, you'll definitely come out to a lot more because, you know, a, a lot of the oh, black man, flame universe. I get if I'm getting, I'm there, you know, I'm there. I just can't show up, you know, it's kind of rude, <laughs> you know. but For I, sure. I, I like to, I like to, I always like to find out something about the fans, uh, you know, uh, you know, what they do um what's their what's their passion everyone has a little passion in their lives and they don't they don't often get a chance to express it that is so true and i definitely feel that there is a demand you know mm -hmm. for you to be at more of these conventions because i you know the music of killer clowns is just as important as the characters that are mm -hmm. in there um you know, it's like one of the things I've always felt about even modern day, you know, horror films. And let's say in the last 20 years, mm -hmm. you know, the music really sets up, let's say, a kill. It really sets up, mm -hmm. oh, you know, the boogeyman is coming, um, you know, every step of the way. It just music as a whole can mm -hmm. just get you right on the edge of your seat. Like, oh, shit, I know something's going to happen. I just don't right. know when. And people start to sweat. <laughs> I just love one, one of my uh, favorite uh, composers. Uh, he does the uh, the Conjuring. Uh, oh, uh, the OK. Song, Joseph yeah. Bashara. It's and, the best part of the uh, film, if you ask me. Yeah, it's really great. <laughs> Real create, real artist, real a real artist, and I just admire his uh, his and his approach. Absolutely, uh, even uh, you know, um, shoot, Insidious like that. Mm -hmm. The strings mm -hmm. in the very beginning when they show the title, mm -hmm. that always gripped me. Like I'm I'm in for a hell of a ride, right? But. Even if I get disappointed, I don't give a shit because the beginning of the film totally gripped me. <laughs> and I can remember, you know, when I was uh, in Kent State getting my music degree, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we got to the composing part and I'm just like, yeah, I kind of knew I was out of my depth there, but mm -hmm. you've definitely taken that form and giving us these nightmarish themes that are just amazing. Well, uh, you know. I, I, in, I endeavor, uh, I endeavor to continue and to always explore new types of musical frontiers, uh, which I'm very happy, happily doing with the killer clowns video game. I'm fascinated that you um, I can't wait till that comes out. I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated to learn more of, about your music. I, I heard little bits and pieces of it. And I really, your, your metal band, you, you're primarily drummer and what else? I do. Uh, I do play piano. Um, uh -huh. I haven't done it in a long time. Uh, mm -hmm. Occasionally, you know, throughout some of the albums I've done in the past, I was able mm -hmm. to do a little bit of key work here and there just to mm -hmm. kind of add to a song. Mm -hmm. um, but even as a drummer, I, I, I do look at, you know, all of the different pieces and how each musician can bring something to the table. 
that can really create the That's mood because key. I'm a lyricist as well. Oh wow. Yeah, I got just I can't sing. <laughs> Join the club. <laughs> Oh, I'm not alone. Holy shit balls. All right. Great. Uh, because people are always like, really? You wrote those lyrics? Well, why aren't you singing them? I'm like, I'm no Don Henley, man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not behind the kit with like a, a you know, uh, a, a mic headset. Uh, right. I, I can't do that stuff because when I'm behind the kit, I'm in a completely different zone. That's awesome. That That's, that, that's just me, you know. Yeah. <laughs> that's incredible yeah and there's nothing i gotta say you, you could identify with this uh often like when i'm cutting drums I'll, I'll get in the room with the drummer and he says you know it's gonna be really loud and i go yeah, yeah i know but I, I have these headphones to protect my ear but i'm never gonna i'm never gonna experience you know because the air is actually it's actually displacing air and it's actually hitting you you know you, yes you, i'm never gonna be able to feel that again so i want to at least be with it that's why i think it's that's why i think it's really encouraging to see how much live music is being performed because it is truly a much different experience than just listening to it on headphones or cranking up your uh, uh your 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 uh, sound system and mm -hmm. um you know i i'm so glad to see um people perform it's really awesome and there's there's some bands that like hey the guys are up there in years but they, they can still play their music you know absolutely as you know, long and, as they're and, not using and backing the new bands. tracks <laughs> what's that i said as long as they're not using backing tracks <laughs> wow i you know i don't even know i don't know if i can i don't even know if i could tell these days you know i i last big um uh, a place I went to where I saw a bunch of bands. I mean, they were all playing live and they all sounded mm -hmm. really good. And these aren't like famous bands. These are just like people. Who, oh, you know, trust just, me. All the talent is in the underground. That's for sure. Yeah, that's <laughs> no kidding. No kidding. They and, care. Uh, it's because yeah, they I care. They don't have some, you know, million dollar, you know, engineer uh right. you know making them sound good you know or they, whether or they, they don't have to or, don't. or they don't have to go with the fear of like oh our our audience is expecting to hear exactly what they hear on the album you know what i mean i, re oh, I remember that frank, kills bands oh yeah yeah I, I remember frank zappa used to talk about that all the time and go why why wouldn't you want to hear a different version of a guitar solo than that's on the album because it's going to be special that night, you know, and there's some bands, they just play their, play what's, the, you know, they memorize their solo from the album and they just keep playing it. Absolutely. Well, it has been an absolute blast getting a look into the genius of the composing that you've done, not only just for killer clowns uh, from outer space, but every project you've touched, it's like, it's so personal. The vibe is always just dead on. Um, what uh, message would you like to leave with uh, the fans out there that have uh, tuned in and, uh, you know, to get a kind of a glimpse into your mind of how this all came about. He's, he's, uh, he was having bad dreams before he was taking a nap, but he needs to, needs dad to move him back to sleep <laughs> i have been it's really a i'm really uh thrilled to uh to be here i'm really honored that you asked me to sit here and, and blab forever i hope you edit that part out where i couldn't remember <laughs> I'd be, if he good, saw man. that he would be hurt he would literally literally cry um, but anyway, no. I, I, I've been, I had the, uh, I'm really have been blessed to be able to work with some talented people and very creative people. And what's always wonderful is that working with creative people where everyone likes, everyone contributes their thing. That's like, that's very special that they can, uh, you know, bring together into like, whether it's a movie or whether it's a song or anything like that, there's nothing like that. And that's that's the trick is to find those people that um, you work yes. well with that that can complement each other. 
It's all about synergy. If everybody has the same goals in mind, so a how project we... is going to be oh, that so... much better. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yes. And you, you obviously been around the block a little bit where, you know, those too much, those, that concept, <laughs> that concept takes place. So do we say, do we give a, a hug to everybody? <laughs> He's kind of creepy. Uh, He's kind of cute. You know, I, I, I really think it's beyond the creepy. It is considered cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, to a point where people are like rooting for the clowns in the film to do their thing. Mm-hmm. And that's what horror is all about. It's not about who ends up surviving. It's about all the awesome stuff that, you know, the, the villains can do. And uh, we love right. our, our villains, uh, right. you know, whether it be Freddy, Chucky, or any of those great clowns and killer clowns. So, <laughs> And the fan, like you said, the fans have spoken. Yeah, they have a video game coming. What does that yes. tell you? Killer if you Planet haven't Space, seen the, the film, game. yeah, yes. If you haven't seen the film out there uh, in Black Flame Land, and I'm pretty sure most of you have, <laughs> especially from all the comments. Uh, but uh, it is currently on Tubi. It's free. God damn it. Go yeah. watch it. If you haven't, man, I'm telling you, once the movie starts and that music hits, you are sucked into John's world and the Kyoto brothers at the same time. <laughs> Just a great story uh, and a great film. And l- let's face it, cult classic. Mm-hmm. There's a reason for that. Every oh, yeah. time somebody sees it, resonates it, it with grows. people so much. People, people like it. I think it sparks their, um, their creative um, part of their psyche as well. You know, it, it, considering all the the fan art that's generated from Killer Clowns. You know, it's just just amazing. like you were talking about. Uh, you know, the tattoos at the beginning. Uh huh. You know, right? People, There's I mean, a reason people, that's people a, that's do this to have a sleeve. Like your whole arm, were the highlights from the movie? Or there's a there's a in um, Ohio that he travels all over the place. I, I think he's retired, you know, and he he goes on vacations and stuff like that. He has giant on his back, like colorful, so t- tastefully done. It's incredible. Um, it's if you go through some of my likes on my Facebook and likes on my Instagram, you, you might run across run across them, but it's just like just epic, just epic, you know. That now that's just body art. And then there's people that do sculpture. There are um, there are professional uh, set designers that create their own props just to have in the studio. <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean, it, like it's, it's dedication. Uh, because yeah. what what everybody that worked on that film helped create history, mm-hmm. and uh, we appreciate that and so much more. And me personally, because you know I'm, I'm like a multi kind of a fan. I love mm-hmm. a lot of different genres. Obviously, horror is my favorite, but mm-hmm. you know I've got to hear your work on so many of those other things as well, and it's just it's top notch. So anybody out there that thinks that any kind of horror film or let's say you love a good crime genre or, you know, something like that, music definitely makes it that much better. And we're we're just so thankful that we have guys like you who can bring these stories to life in an amazing way and create all those emotions, not just from the actors, but from the music, and when they they combine, it's like holy shit balls. <laughs> so thank you so much well, for all the good work. I really do. appreciate it, and and uh, that absolutely me to to dig deeper and work that much harder. <laughs> Most definitely, always musicians. Let me tell you, musicians, indie actors, always humble. <laughs> Even though you've Deliver. done like. 
some monumental things. Just mm-hmm. totally humble, and and that's that's because we care about our craft. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, you know, as uh, you guys are set, settling down for the night, getting ready for that last work day, and you got visions <laughs> of all the beautiful clowns from Killer Clowns of Outer Space. Just remember, John made that shit happen. But most importantly, stay heavy. Possibly. <laughs> Because my computer sucks. Ah!